for the last several years, I have a class of about two to three hundred, and I mostly seniors. And I ask them, so, just out of curiosity, how many of you have a job waiting for you? Well, about half of them did have jobs until about a three or four years ago, and then it started slipping, 40%, 20%. And the last couple of years, of course, none. These are really bright kids. Um, and I know that a lot of this can be attributed to the financial crisis, right? I mean, we're experiencing what's called a jobless recovery. Don't you love that term? Jobless recovery. No, it's unemployment. Uh, but the economists keep coming up with these terms. But something more fundamental is happening. Um, I teach about it. I'm hoping the message gets through. Uh, it's globalization. It's the idea, um, as Thomas Friedman pointed out, that the world is flat. Don't you love that one, too? The world is flat. Well, what he really means is everybody is competing with everybody else. Wow. Every community, every person, every nation is competing with everyone, every other nation, every community, and so forth. Now, we have lost um, so many jobs to manufacturing. Uh, somewhere else is cheaper. We lost the whole service industry. What is next for us? When Daniel Bell started talking <clears throat> about this, he's the Harvard guy, um, in 1973, he said the com we're, there's a coming post-industrial society. And that was pretty simple. It was a seminal book as far as everybody was, who was reading it at the time because he said, you know, um, uh, most of our crop, uh, cotton, can, is now goes through this new device uh, manufactured um, and patented by a guy named Eli Lilly. Remember that? Okay. And he said, um, computers are coming along. So the people who move from the farms to the factories are going to get jobs in this new post-industrial era which we've now come to accept as the information age. Well, here we are, uh, unemployed and growing. Somebody at state says, you know, it's really like 25% because there are so many people that aren't, aren't just not looking anymore. Or they're underemployed. Not just the ones that are reported as, uh, to their unemployment office uh, every month. But what is it? I mean, what do we call it? We don't even have a name for it. Business Week, Mary McGeechee here was with Business Week at one time. Um, he said a few years ago, we're entering the creative age. And then about uh, a year later, they abandoned it. Uh, they now call it the age of innovation. And I happened to talk with uh, <clears throat> one of our colleagues. And he said, yeah, business people didn't identify with this. Uh, we're a business publication, and most people thought we're talking about artists. No, he said, and I say, and you know, we're talking about all of us. It's not just the digital economy, just using the internet, just global. It's about creativity in all its forms. Now, uh, we're not all going to be da Vinci. Uh, with, and paint with both sides of our hands and be engineers and painters and architects and so on. But uh, as uh, Richard Florida has pointed out, we all can be creative. Uh, even the, uh, the guy who collects trash can be creative. Um, Pink, who's been mentioned a couple of times, I think comes closer to helping us understand um, that there is a whole new mind. I wish I wrote that book. You know, I, to send my kids to college and not have to worry about the rent. Anyway, um, 
1996, I was working for Governor Wilson on a, a big problem in California, uh, technology and education. <laughs> this state, which invented the internet, the pen-based computer, the silicone wafer, has the lowest number of computers in schools than any other state in the nation. Ask me, I don't know why, but we do. I had just taken this job, and I got called to LA, not far from here. Jim Cameron was making the Titanic, and he was one of those people who was asking for more H-1B visas. How many of you know what H-1B visas are? Yeah, most of you do. Well, if you can't find somebody in the workplace, you, you, know, you get one of those H-1B visas, which allows you to uh, bring somebody in from China or India or somewhere else. Well, here's why they wanted more visas. They wanted kids to work on their films, and Silicon Valley was also involved in the ask, kids who understood computers but could also draw. I said, well, uh, we, we obviously have these kids. We don't. 20 years ago, uh, there's this international test, and we didn't do very well. I think we're about ninth in math and 11th in science. So uh, there was an uproar in America. There's always an uproar in America, isn't there? <clears throat> but this time they said, we can fix this problem easily. We will simply eliminate art and music and concentrate on math. Have you heard this one before? Yeah. We're 24th and 27th, respectively, now. We still don't have the jobs that we should have. Uh, about this time that I was working on this problem, I ran across a guy named Robert Root Bernstein. How many of you have ever heard of him? He's really a, a this is a great book, by the way. Uh, but he never promotes it. He doesn't go on any book tours, any signings, uh, whatever. But he was a MacArthur winner, and with all that money, you know, MacArthur prizes are, what is it, a million bucks? Uh, he decided to come to San Diego, smart guy, because he lives in Michigan, uh, <laughs> where he could <clears throat> study AIDS patients. That's his, his uh, forte. But he got curious about why uh, some people succeed and some people fail, and he began to look at the top 100 scientists who lived over the last 200 years. <laughs> I don't know why he did this, but he did it, and he, what he found was startling. Uh, Galileo, you know, who is, uh, had a lot to say about the earth and the sun and so on, uh, he got no money from the Catholic Church for this. Um, <laughs> He was actually a poet and an author. That's how he made his living. This guy, uh, who we all know by his wonderful haircut, supercuts, um, was, working, <laughs> was working in a uh, uh, patent office as a clerk, uh, but he was invited all the time to play his violin. He loved his violin. He was a great violinist. People who heard him said, even today, nobody is around today who heard him then, but uh, this guy was so good, he would probably play in Carnegie Hall. And this man, Samuel Morris, who invented the Morse code, dots and dashes, um, and the telegraph, never made a nickel on uh, the Telegraph. But if you go to Washington, D.C., in the Capitol building, you'll see two of his wonderful portraits. He was a painter. These people, these hundred or so odd people, were all accomplished in the fine arts as well as the hard sciences. 
But you know, the fine arts isn't masculine. Uh, it isn't certain. There is such ambiguity about the arts. So people today still recognize accomplishment in the sciences, not the arts. Or they never see the connection between the two. Now, here we are in 2010. Uh, this poor guy, uh, Howard Gardner, I found three of his books on Amazon. Uh, he's getting a lot of hell these days because of uh, multiple intelligences. And he said, we all learn differently, so why don't we just accept this fact? Well, the fact is, neuroscientists are saying, no, uh, these are all pathways to the brain, but we've got to be interested in learning, and it's the, it's the, uh, the repertoires that are important. Anyway, after three decades, uh, three times uh, th uh, published, we did have a wonderful decade where we looked at the human brain and we finally understand that there are two hemispheres of the brain. <laughs> One which we normally associate with the arts and the other we normally associate with the sciences. Oh no, we also have something called the MRI. And we know uh, not because of Mozart, but because of something called the Mozart effect, that 10 minutes of shopping, or shopping, <laughs> uh, th it's, you'll score nine points higher on your IQ. We know that when people do something that's right brain, it enhances or creates synapses, firing pins in the left hemisphere. Hello, why is it then that kids who perform musically, learn to play a musical instrument, seem to do better on math quizzes? Um, George Bush, he's not the only one, uh, so I don't want to punish, pick on poor George here. He's no longer in office too. Realized we had a problem, a job problem and it was getting worse, and so he allocated 170, no, $138 million for more math and science. It's an initiative called STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and you probably have all heard of STEM. Researchers, haven't you? Heard of STEM? Yeah. Uh, STEM, really, there's STEM institutes, there's STEM programs, there's, I mean, everything is STEM, and, and, and I said, well, um, no real harm done, except where's the arts? And about a year ago, I met a fella who retired recently after having served for 20 years as the president of Qualcomm, that little company down the road. Um, and he said, you know, we don't need just STEM, we need STEAM. I said, uh, do you mean the arts? He said, yeah, he said, you know, this is an uncertain world. We need our engineers to understand ambiguity. But more than that, the more I've looked around, the more I realize that we need creative, innovative people. And the way engineering is taught today, they aren't gonna get from here to there unless they really understand the art. And how can we get it somehow back into the curriculum? So, you know, my message to you is a very simple one, and one probably you all understand and, uh, and appreciate. The arts are fun. <laughs> They're engaging. Uh, in poor schools, we also know they increase in, in attendance. But more than that, they help people connect the dots. Kids who study art in schools paint on a bigger canvas. But here's what's really relevant to the workplace today. We know that the arts or art-infused education provides real thinking skills. That the arts enhance math and science comprehension and the arts actually change people in ways we can't imagine. Um, 
That's the reason I say to you the arts are essential. Uh, this guy, <clears throat> who is our Secretary of Education, finally, last week, uh, actually a few weeks ago, agrees. Uh, I won't read this uh, verbatim. He says, the arts are not a frill. Uh, the, hence the topic uh, before you today. It's important in this global economy that kids are competitive, uh, are creative and innovative, but it ain't gonna happen. I'm, he's the Secretary of Education, but it ain't gonna happen. And the reason simply is that nothing happens anymore in Washington. But you can make things happen. You have more power than you've ever had in the history of the world. Ken Robinson says creativity is as important, maybe more important than literacy. Ken Robinson, you heard him earlier say, we need a revolution. Yes, we do. Let me leave you with a quote that I love from Walter Lippmann, which I think is very apt today. We are in the early beginnings of a struggle to remake our civilization. It is not a good time for politicians. It is a time for prophets and leaders, explorers, inventors, and pioneers, and for those willing to plant trees for their children to sit under. Thank you.